begin with a little reading from the actual book that we're going to discuss tonight. So take it away, Dale. A very brief reading. I'm going right. to give you two tonight, one about Stroh and one about Jay-Z. Um, and, and just because it's referenced in the book, everybody calls her Stroh, so that's what she's called in the book, and everybody calls him Jay-Z, and so that's what he's called in the book. Um, this is about the Scottsboro Boys. Despite and because of its minimalism, the physical production was exhilarating. It opened on a bare stage and some chairs, as if declaring we have nothing to hide. Those chairs transformed into every location the show required because every design element worked seamlessly to tell the story. <coughs> My favorite spatial transformation took us almost instantly from a row of boxcars on a sunny southern afternoon into a dank jail cell. I've already described Stroh's ability to entertainingly misdirect attention as the scene is reshaped. The audience didn't see the actors resetting the chairs to form a cell until she wanted them to, so it seemed like stage magic. The lights carved out a bright square into the darkness, containing and constraining the space. The sound of a steel cell door slamming as the final chair was set into place created an undeniable sonic reality. The prison guard jackets and hats slipped on by the end men helped describe the location. All of it was just enough to trigger the infinite imagination of the audience and make them see, hear, and feel the most cramped, awful prison cell ever. The energy at the tiny vineyard theater was electric. Audiences were blown away by the show. Word of mouth spread quickly, and we were soon sold out for the entire run. Everything was magical, and then the New York Times review came out. <laughs> so it always ends that way so often. So forgive me for opening for the three of you on a somewhat um, self-involved question, but do reviews still matter these ten years later? Yes, I, I think they do. I think we, we think they don't, mm -hmm. and people all say, oh, they don't matter anymore, there's so much social media, but they absolutely do. Yeah. They're personal. Yeah. Too. They're very personal, you know, uh, I find. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they do matter. I don't know how much they matter to box office. I would, I would imagine a show that is struggling would be helped by enthusiastic reviews. But, um, you know, I just, uh, uh, I, find it, I find it difficult to have things written about my work and... You know, unless they're very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. <laughs> but do you, do you have a rule? Right? Do, do you read them that opening night, or do you wait until much later? I, I read them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah but you know, yeah. the, the, the thing is, the, the bad reviews can be devastating, but the good reviews are never good enough. <laughs> So it's like, why, why should we be there? Because the good people will say, oh, that was fantastic, but they didn't talk about that actor. And you think, why did they talk about that actor? <laughs> so, the, you know, so it's very, very difficult. Uh, uh, but, yeah, I, I only read them once, though. I don't, I don't dwell on them. But I do read them. Yeah, I read them. I read, I read my own. Uh, I sort of bullshit, bullshit my name, them, but, I, but I do read them. And I, I always think about the... In, the seagull Tregorn says, uh, when they when they praise me, I'm happy, and when they criticize me, I'm out of sorts for three days. Yeah. Uh, that's about right. <laughs> three days, three months. Right. <laughs> I, I sometimes wonder if it's not about the type of show, right? If it's a new musical like The Scottsboro Boys that um, maybe doesn't have big television or film names attached, um, a, t a glowing Times review really can boost the box office. But if it's a show like um, say Back to the Future, which is on Broadway right now and very design heavy, um, it comes kind of with a built-in audience, and so it doesn't really matter what the New York Times is writing about it because the audience isn't reading that. Um, so I, I, well, I guess we have two of the most important directors of the last quarter, half century, with us and a designer, and so I kind of want to put you on the spot and ask, um, be honest, when you're reading a script for a new play or a new musical, do you see a set in your mind? And how open are you to um, the first impression of your designer diverging from what you see in your mind's eye? Well, Jerry, go for That's a great question. I don't, uh, I don't, when I first read or listen to a piece of material, I'm not necessarily seeing the set. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm reacting to the people and the situation, and I'm either if it's meant to be a comedy, I measure whether I'm laughing out loud or not. If I'm not laughing out loud, it's not a good comedy, <laughs> you know. And and, I, and if I'm 
if I'm just some certain writing is great and some writing is just not as good as the best. And I look forward to I look forward to the best writing because it transports me, but I don't necessarily see a set right away. Mm -hmm. um, that's you know, is there a rest of it? Yes, that's basically it. You know? Yeah, I, I I agree with that. When you read first reading a script, you just reading the story and hoping that the story works and yeah. hoping hoping that that the plot goes forward. So it's mainly about the text. That's what you're first reading. But I do have a visual response to things that I read, and I think it's because of maybe movement or something, and how could this show move? And uh, so then, then the visual of something comes to me, you know, and, and uh, so I do start with something in my head, but yeah, I'm very collaborative with like Beowulf, you know, uh, I'll say something to him, and then he'll come back with a model, and it'll be It'll be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, for Beowulf, I wonder, when you're working with a director, which do you prefer? Somebody who comes in with like a very strong idea of what the floor plan looks like, or somebody who's totally open to your... No, I mean, you know, oddly, to answer your first question, oh. I don't even think about what the set looks like when I'm reading it for the first yeah. time. I really don't. I, I, it's the same thing. I'm reading the story trying to get the feel of what it is. What does it feel like and what, what's the emotional world of it? Yeah. And it's not until I talk to these guys that I, you know, that's, I want to know their reaction to it too. And all that will begin to inform what the visual world is. And sometimes, you know, there's something in a script that, whatever, a car has to blow up or someone has to dance on an I-beam or something. There's stuff in there that requires scenic things that, that are going to eventually be important. But it's... That stuff is all a little secondary, figuring out how, what style are we going to tell the story in. But then to answer your second question, no, if I walk into a meeting and somebody says I want the set to be green and I want a door over there, I sort of feel like, well, you don't need me then. I hire a tech director and they can do that for you. Um, and what's, what's exciting about this thing that we do is that... We will we sit and talk often a lot, really, before we get to you know. I mean, we didn't really have research and we might have things, you know, images, but um, is at its best when we're we have a good collaboration. Whatever we come up with, it's it's not going to be something I would have done by myself, and it's not going to be something the director would have done by themselves. It's going to be something better and stronger because it's it's a con. And you know, and, and on a show, when you get you know forty people all working in concert to make whatever that idea is work. That's what's so exciting about it, when, when all of that does finally pull together and tell one story. Do, do you think it's important to treat the set almost like a character with its own arc and story? I don't. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I just read, there was an article in the Times Magazine by, about a production designer that talked very much about the set as a character. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know what, I never do that. She said, no, you don't. Um, I, it's, and I think people say it to me a lot, I think, because I think it's something you say to oh, set designers. it sounds good. It sounds, yeah. it sounds smart. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, you know, it's, it's the vehicle for the presentation of the life in the script, you know, yeah. and you want to get it just right, and you want to make sure it serves the storytelling, and that you can get from point A to point B without wasting precious milliseconds, and, you know, but that's, I mean, that's, that's yeah. what I'm yeah. It's more that than it's than that it is a it's not a character, it's an environment. And 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 it's at its best, it's also something thematic that that that's creating a frame that that helps helps you understand the story that's playing out. It helps set the tone, you know, because the tone is so important, you know, and I, I think that's yeah. I must say, by the way, I I love this book and I love Beowulf and I love Stro. Directors rarely, if ever, get to see each other. <laughs> we were so happy to see each other. Yeah, not really, because we're never in the room together, in the rehearsal room. And so reading, when I'm in anticipation of this, I went back to, the, to your book, and I read m my stuff to make sure I hadn't said anything completely idiotic. <laughs> but the joy was reading Stroh's interview with you, because you get to know someone that you've known, not known yeah. Stroh for a long time, but yeah. to read about your beginnings and how you got to where you, I find it tremendously uh, effective and affecting. So, anyway, so read the book. It's a read. <laughs> it was part of the fun in writing it for me. Was I, I, I've had the good luck to work with the two of you and, and some of the other like real greats, like the, the giants of this industry and the, the 
best storytellers in the world. And but everybody goes at it slightly differently. And in a funny way, that the two of you are more similar maybe than some of the other directors in there. That you both, both Jerry and Stro, when we were putting shows together, it's like millisecond by millisecond. We use that word, but it, these guys know how to like dice a, a literally a second of stage time into like six things happening and make sure that those seconds all line up just perfectly and land at the right moment so the music's doing something, the lights are doing something, and my set better damn be doing the same thing <laughs> or I'm in trouble. Um, and it's, it is, it's, I mean, I guess it's, it's in any kind of directing is that, but watching the two of you guys work is the thing that I, I'm always in awe of, is, is, is this honing of seconds and how when you get that right, then the emotion lands right, and when you get it wrong, it doesn't. And something can be funny when you get those seconds lined up right, and not funny when you don't, even though everyone's <laughs> saying the same words. And you've got, I don't know, you know, I've heard, you've got X number of minutes of goodwill from the audience. We, yeah. we do. 12 minutes, say, 15 minutes, yeah. 10 maybe, yeah. you know. Whatever it is, you better make sure that within that time, you've gotten the people to care and want to be there and hope. You want people to be hooked because if you don't in the first 12 or 15 minutes, anticipation turns into polite attention. I think Mike Nichols said something about yeah. nothing worse than polite attention. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, if, if it's, if it's hard to fake in a comedy. It's easy to fake in a serious piece because people are either listening and, paying, and caring or they're just politely attending. And There's always that telltale sound of a... Um, cell phone slipping from a dozing patron's hand. Lore <laughs> <laughs> that you got, ah. Uh, can you feel that? Do you feel that shift, like instinctively now, having done this for so long? You could feel the breath of an audience. Sure. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that's what previews are for. You know, mm. we, we, we stand in the back and you can feel the breath of an audience and, and know that, that that's got to move faster, that that joke's not going to work, and it's gone tomorrow night, you know? Because some things are very funny in our living room, and they're just not funny in the theater. Uh, so, but that's what previews are for, and, and it's feeling the breadth of an audience and knowing uh, what you have to do the next night to change it, to make, because you always want the story going forward and the audience to be paying attention and, and being uh, entertained. Both of you have a brilliant sense of timing, which is why I have been curious for the last couple of years, Ms. Stroman, how did you let him convince you to do a rotating set for POTUS, which is this door-slamming comedy? <laughs> oh, well, are you kidding? That was the only way to do that show. <laughs> well, POT I mean, POTUS was so funny, and, and uh, but it had to have all these rooms from the White House, and but, but the show was written as a farce, and... and what was so wonderful of what the playwright did, because women are never in. A, it, it, women are in a farce; they're secondary characters, um, or or jokes or whatever. So now you had seven women playing this farce, and so we needed doors to slam, but we also needed all these locations in the White House, and and uh, so when you read the script, it was like how how to do this, you know. But Beowulf came in with a turntable, and it was yes, that's what mm -hmm. what it needed. So when they started running in the White House and the turntable started going and the doors started slamming, I mean, it was, the I think, the only way to have pulled that off. I'm very like, curious how other people are doing it around the country, and I, I don't know what the answer is. Yes, I can't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> well, did, it did you have white knuckle moments in, in the tech? I mean, how long did it take to figure that out? Because it was really impressive. Yeah. You know, when it worked. But I can imagine disasters when yes, it doesn't. Well, we, did, we did have to bring in a faster motor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think we did. Like, in rehearse, I think even before you started really rehearsing, we got a bunch of freestanding doors in a rehearsal room, and we set up what each of the rooms was going to be, and we said, which, what door swing is going to be funniest? Because when you're doing a joke, the, the way a door slams, uh, it can be funnier, at, or it can kill the joke. So you need either have to say your joke and then slam the door or, or the way you enter. So all the doors had to be figured out of, of which the way they would open. Does it which open way into the room or out of the, out of the room, room and what works better? To help the joke. And so we just did that with doors before we did the set. But it meant like us stepping through the script and Strom knowing enough how she wanted to stage the show so that we knew that so-and-so's entrance was coming through this door, not that one. And so we could make, make the door do what it needed to do. And I think you might have flipped hinges on one of them in tech, but I mean, we more or less got it right. I think yeah. By the time we got on stage, we 
It was important to do. Yeah. Mr. Zachs had an incredible insight about Lend Me a Tenor, which is, of course, also a door slamming comedy that you directed on Broadway. Um, there was a quarter-inch gap, I believe, between the frame <laughs> and the door to make this work. How, how much of your jobs, all three of you, is accumulating just little bits of knowledge like that that you can repurpose? I would never have thought of that. Uh -huh. it's the, I'm totally dependent on the kindness of the writer and the designer. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, Zach is referring to Lend Me a Tenor. Tony Walton, who was the brilliant set designer, uh, designed the door so that there was a quarter inch between the door structure and the wall. So you, uh, space, but you never saw it. And so you could slam the doors as violently or as enthusiastically or yeah. emphatically as you wanted to without the walls. The walls. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. That yeah. was, you know. I couldn't believe it. that's Tony Walton. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought of that when we were doing photos, actually, and I thought of trying to do it, but because it was a turntable and you saw both sides of the door, right. you right. couldn't actually get away with it. <laughs> so we had to build it like a house out of two by fours and steel, so it just wouldn't move. <laughs> right. um, I would love to uh, hear another reading from the book um, about Meteor Shower, or to show you An another farce, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, once, once Jay-Z and I had discussed some of the challenges, we turned our attention to the meteor shower of the title and the night sky that featured prominently in the script. I spoke conceptually about the cosmos as a metaphor for marriage, musing that maybe the husband and wife were like two celestial bodies locked in a gravitational dance. Before I could wax on about attraction and repulsion, Jay-Z stopped me and said, Save all that nonsense for your interview with the New York Times, Moisha. I'm a plumber, not a poet. <laughs> I laughed, but it took his meaning. Metaphors and metaphysics could wait until we figured out how to make this quirky play flow swiftly and effectively from start to finish. And, and what Jay-Z said about himself isn't true. He creates wonderfully poetic productions precisely because he keeps his laser focus on the physical particulars, making sure every moment leads to the next, like clockwork. The mechanics of putting a play together, the craft that results in a seamless, consistent storytelling, is less glamorous than the artistic ideas behind the production. But these nuts and bolts are essential. Art and craft must be present in equal measure. So bear with me as this chapter focuses more on plumbing than poetry. <laughs> <laughs> For the three of you, how much would you say your job, if you had to assign a percentage, I know this is somewhat arbitrary, but if you had to assign a percentage, how much of your job is plumbing? And how much is poetry? <laughs> I, 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 would, I would say 80% of my work is plumbing. And by pl plumbing, I'm talking about figuring out the machine, how, how the machine is going to work to deliver the play. A lot of it is that. And I find that if I pay real attention to that and really focus on that, more poetic ideas will be born. I, I need tremendous, I think we all need to feel as secure and as prepared. I mean, Stroh's a nut for preparing, and I, as am I, which is, I just think it's tremendously important to, to be prepared so that when the accidents come, you can, you can, the happy accidents, you're open to receiving them as opposed to, I don't know, trying to insist on doing it the way you had planned three months ago. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah I think I agree with that. If I, and if I could just, yeah. if I could speak for you, Beowulf. Uh, <laughs> the thing is about what, what Beowulf does is he's, he is an artist, a real artist, a poet and artist, but he also um, understands how a set should move. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I've worked, we've worked with many set designers that are too much of one or the other. There, I've worked with set designers that are just architects, and the set's n not beautiful or poetic or doesn't, doesn't go with the research somehow. They were just worried about how it moved. And then I've worked with poets who couldn't care how the set moved, and you know we were stuck with this pretty thing that was just standing there and, and didn't, didn't know how to make a set change or anything. So, but, but, but Beowulf is a real, real artist, but he also knows how the mechanics move. You know, you, you, you push, you tap into um, Hudson Scenic to help it all, but, <laughs> but, but you understand <clears throat> how it works. So you have, you know, the balance of that, and a lot of set designers don't. It's, it's, it, the, that's actually what the title of the book is. It's, it's all about 
for me. It's, it's honestly the thing that gets me the most excited is how do I make some kind of a kinetic sculpture that will shift so that, you know, it's taking us from place to place maybe in the play and in, in establishing locations, but how it does that is as much as anything how I affect the pace of the play. And I think it's, it's again, why I love both of these guys so much because it is... How, how the show moves, how the people move, how the set moves, how the lighting moves, how, the, how everything moves in concert is, is that machine that Jerry's talking about. That we, we're making this machine of, of steel and wood and people and sound and light, and all of it has to work like clockwork together. And, um, and when it does, it's magic. Um, and when it does with a good story, it's really magic. When, it, when, you know, when we get all of the production right, and the script isn't good, it doesn't help. Yeah. Um, and and a, I think a great script can be occasionally ruined by, by the wrong production choices. It's certainly like it's easy for a big lumbering set to get in the way of a show. And it's the thing I live in terror of, is you know, you try to do these big effects, but you don't you want it to be exhilarating and not and not stepping on the story. And that's especially when we get to some of the bigger, more involved things, it's tricky. Um, and you don't really know until you put all the pieces together and check whether it's going to work or not. Like, you think it's going to work, and yeah. good reason to believe it will work, but sometimes you as, you, know, you get to the thing that you, you planned it out so carefully, you're so sure it's going to work, and it just is like a lead balloon on stage, yeah. and then you got to come up with something else. I've heard a lot of designers tell me that if you can get the scenic shop on your side, and even as an active collaborator, it can get you very far actually, to make your job easier. I can't imagine what it would be like if they weren't on your side. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't have the stage hands on your side. I mean, you've got to, you've got to have everybody on your side. It's, yeah. it is, it's, it's such a collab, like from top to bottom, I, I would like cringe at the designer who didn't have the shop on their side. Yeah. Well, There's I, no art form like it, really, where, where collaboration is a big part of it, of creating this piece of art, but it was a giant collaboration. And, and, I mean, that's what's thrilling about it, to collaborate with designers, costume designers, and, and set designers, and lighting designers. I mean, it's wonderful to collaborate. You have, you have that time in the rehearsal room where everything is working, because it's all theoretical. <laughs> Everyone in the rehearsal room thinks it's hysterically funny. <laughs> you know, just, it's so, I mean, but it's all theoretical. It's like being in a lab, and then you, you suffer through text, because you're going inch by inch, putting it together, trying to recreate the show that was flowing. <laughs> Before you leave the rehearsal room, you have run-throughs that are brilliant. You know, you're <laughs> so waiting for nothing. Everyone is on top of it. And the rate of new ideas is extraordinary, which is very important. But once you get into the theater and you start tacking, everything blows apart. I always tell the cast to say goodbye to the show as we go <laughs> into text because they're not going to feel it again for yeah. two weeks or so. Yeah. And then you, know, you have two weeks to deal with reality as opposed to theoretical. Yeah. And then previews, of course, to polish. I think it's one of the big dangers of theater, which is this wonderfully collaborative art form, but at the same time, I think there's always a danger of groupthink, where you're all in there in the process together, you're in the rehearsal room, you know what you're doing is brilliant, and sometimes it just doesn't translate across the plaster line. How do you guard against that? Well, I think, the, the, I mean, that's what the director does. The director yeah, takes exactly. it all yeah. in, and, and, and it, it, uh, you need to be gracious and let people throw ideas on to the table. But if they're heading the wrong way, you know, then that, that, <laughs> you're not going to take that idea. But, but you want people to have the freedom, and you need to set it up to have the freedom and the respect to, to lay these ideas out. But you have to have a strong vision and thought of the tone of the show and, and the truth of the show, you know, based on whatever research you've done. There's nothing that anybody wants more than to be able to look at the stage and say, that was my idea. <laughs> I promise you. And so you've got many people on the team who all want to contribute. And one of the main parts of our job is to say yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes. I always, I always request, <laughs> request. I always <laughs> suggest that if anyone's got an idea, to express it to me privately, because it will protect the possibility of me actually hearing it, as opposed to expressing it in front of the entire room. Oh. 
you, you know what I'm uh -huh. saying. So I encourage people to put forth ideas, but don't do it in front of an audience because the chances of my objectively hearing it and considering it are affected by responding in, in front of the entire group. Do you, do you think of yourselves as politicians in a way, having to balance these various interests in putting together a production? I think it's the part that they don't teach you in MFA programs, <laughs> and you can only learn by failing at it. I, I, there's some truth to that, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think, well, I think that, the, you know, it's that thing about um, designing a room that has respect to it so you feel, people feel, because even, you know, I, I know Kandra Neb always said there's no real bad idea because someone could put a bad idea on the table and then someone else is going to pick that up and turn it into gold. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to stop somebody from saying a bad idea because that bad idea can make you think of something that that's you know satellites off of that. So it's it's making sure that you have to leave all egos outside. All, anybody who's on your team, you know. I always say the director is not quite a politician. I always say that the director has to be a benevolent dictator. Um, that it's, totally. And it, it, it is the most. It's it, if a director is not, especially with a musical, maybe less so in a play, but in a musical, if the director doesn't have absolute control of the room, you're in trouble. Um, and it over the writers, over any of us designers, over you know, and every one of us thinks we know how to fix the show, and we all tell you all the all the ways you can fix it. But it it if. If that starts to slip, and, and all of you have your own kind of techniques for keeping control of the room. I just, I, civility is really important to me. No one being embarrassed is really important to me because I was an actor. I've been embarrassed by casting directors and people I've auditioned for, and I'm determined to try to minimize that and never do that because it, it, it never helps, you know? I just, you know. Occasionally, you have to lose your temper to just remind. I, I do occasionally in the middle of text or something, or I'll just get a fart machine and blow it in. <laughs> you know, yeah. Which you is know, in the book. It is. You know, just in the hand, the, 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 the mic to get every. You know, when there's 20 people on stage and everyone's trying to figure something out, it's nice to just blow a fart gun into that. <laughs> into the god mic and watch everyone on stage just go <laughs> you know sorry about that don't don't go there's actually you address this in the book um, uh, specifically about meteor shower on page 240 you wrote sometimes when things aren't working I'm concerned that the crew isn't taking the problem seriously enough I throw a calculated temper tantrum and you didn't on that production I believe this had to do with there was two rotating parts of the set and then they had to all move away at once and it was very difficult um, there was some some other part of the book I'm forgetting which show it was where you did throw a temper tantrum I think it might have been Prince of Broadway yeah it's, I, I, have to, I have not thrown a temper tantrum on stage in a long time I, I don't I think what the, the best thing about winning a Tony Award <laughs> realized is that people listen to you when they didn't before <laughs> whether they should or not um, and maybe as they pile up people listen to you even more but it but it certainly when I was younger there were times when I felt like I, I had to blow up and lose it um, to, to get everyone to focus. And I, don't, I think it upsets me as much as it upsets anyone else. And I tend to not do it uncontrollably. But if, if you just feel like people are not, in my case, it's the crew, and you know, are not dealing with things, um, you sometimes have to. And I, don't, I feel like also sometimes it's my job as the designer to do it so the director doesn't have to do mm. it. Um, uh, you know, especially because it's, it, the set is the thing that's going to grind us to the hall, to a halt. You know, it, there are other things that will fuck up the show, but the set can actually make it stop at its tracks um, if that's not being taken. It's just the best when that happens. <laughs> and I've had it happen with both of you. Yeah. Well, one of the nicer things about getting a little older is once I'm a little less inclined to, you know, lose, lose it, get angry. And kind of you know, I just there's other ways to deal with things that don't work. I have discovered over time. Yeah. Is there any positive role for conflict in uh, the theatrical collaboration? No. 
I mean, you can have like a heated discussion. With yeah, I disagree without it being yeah. unpleasant. I mean, I think we started to think of conflict as kind of social media, salt the earth combat, you know? And I, I often think, you know, perhaps good ideas come out of two very contrasting visions thrown on the table in a design meeting. I think that's true, but yeah. that doesn't have to be unpleasant. And yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And it also, like, it doesn't... I think we all try to believe this, and Jerry's right that you like you do want to have your idea up there. But if somebody has a better idea, it works yeah. better. Then it makes the show better. Yeah. And and I always think like it doesn't matter who came up with the good idea in the set. I'm going to get credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it does you know. And if I come up with a great directing idea and one of you puts it in, you're going to get the credit for it. <laughs> so it's it, but but it's only worth doing if it makes the storytelling better, and ultimately the director has to decide that, and all the rest of us are... I get a little myopic. Like, I try to solve it through the set, the lighting is going to try to solve it through the lighting, and everyone's going to try to solve it through the thing that they control. And that's what we... That if the conductor's conducting the orchestra, we're conducting everything, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. and conducting all the elements and what extent they will contribute to the storytelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, there's been an awful lot written in about, you know, theater, a lot of it, um, I have trouble reading because it's very often written by people who have never attempted to make theater. So I find myself spending much more time with the people like yeah. these guys who actually make it. We can, you know, uh, at the end of the day, for me, it's all about excellence. Is it as good as it possibly can be? Are the people in it as, as good as they can be? Is the script, is, does it move the way, you know? Uh, just because it's uh, it's just life and death. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You know? um, I, I mentioned Back to the Future earlier. You've all worked on uh, stage adaptations of well known films: New York, New York, Bronx Tale, um, Stellfire. Um, how much do you have to account for um, when you're doing a well known film, a stage adaptation? How much do you have to account for audience expectations? What that show looks and sounds like. I think you can discuss it. I don't think it affects the storytelling or the script conferences where this scene isn't working. I mean, this sounds like a joke, but it's not funny, so please replace it with something that is, you know... Uh, um, yeah, so I think it might be different for every... Because I would think Back to the Future, they had to get that car right. You know, so they might, might have even, I don't know, started with that. You know, how the sound department can help that car, how set designer can help that car, how the actors can get in, you know. And and it does deliver at the end. It's pretty amazing, the fact. But, um, uh, but, but that's not, I think, doing a musical is a different animal. So I think once you decide to do an adaptation, then you're just dealing with what is a musical. I know uh, certainly with producers, we had to to deliver some very famous lines that Mel Brooks wrote, but but it was still it was a different animal. Um, so how how the music went in and out of it, how the set changed to tell the story, um, how we kept pushing the plot forward, you know that it had to be dealt with in another way. Which of the two sets of the shows you've done at the St. James, the producers or New York, New York, was most difficult to fit backstage? Oh, the producers, because not until they did Frozen in that theater, they ended up blowing out the back wall and right. the sides, and so Disney like sorted things. it all out, you know. And so after we, after Thank Disney, you, Mr. Schumacher. yeah, I know. After Disney like did it for Frozen, then you can go in there. There's all sorts of space back there now. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, producers, the second act hung in the air uh -huh. and uh, on chains, so. During intermission, the crew would have to bring down the second act, the white office, Ula's white office. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, it was it was quite a choreography back there. And the first time you did it, it took... <laughs> yeah. What, yeah. I, mean, I went out at, at uh, intermission and said, I, you know, I think our set change is going to be a little longer, so why don't you go have a drink? And then I said, <laughs> as a matter of fact, why don't you have dinner and then come on back? <laughs> And it was it was forty five minutes. Yeah, well, that, does that become less oh, nerve wracking no. every time that happens yeah. than a first yeah. preview? You just go ahead. Eh, yeah, well, I think some audiences love that in a preview. I, you know what? It's I think that's why they're there. They're, you know. Yeah, the crew needs the same chance. Yeah, yeah to rehearse. Opportunity to rehearse. Yeah, as the actors and yeah. I've had for four or five weeks in a room. 
they need that rehearsal time, and until they yeah. get it, you know, the the the, yeah. the, sh the shift between Act One and Act Two will take forty five minutes. That will take yeah. twenty five. That will take it's only with repetition. Yeah. I was a shivering mess the first night we previewed New York, New York. <laughs> Whether we were going to make all that stuff work. And, uh, and that was your 30th show on Broadway, I believe. It was. It was. Yeah. But it, it doesn't, I, that part of it doesn't get less nerve wracking for me. I mean, I, you sort of have faith that it will get there eventually, but in the moment when it's not getting there, it's not any easier. <laughs> well, your career, Beowulf, has, and all of you really, your career has coincided with this um, tremendous explosion in theatrical technology and design technology, LED lights and uh, sophisticated body mics and all sorts of video and projection um, equipment. Um, what would you say has most changed the game for set design? Um, I mean, I guess it's, it's projection becoming mm -hmm. so affordable, whether it's LEDs or front projection or any of that, that, you know, 30 years ago, it wasn't as powerful and it was expensive and, and there was just a lot less of it because that and now like you know, any kid with an iPhone can make a video. Um, and it is a really powerful tool on stage and one that can very easily derail a show in, in my opinion. I think you and I have talked about this a lot, but I um, I I both love and hate Video on stage, um, and I and I am the bane of all the projection designers I work with because I just hang over them so much. But I have really strong feelings about what I think works on stage and what is a cop out and what it feels like. Um, it's it's actually disconnected from the live people on stage. It's almost better if the video enhances the actual drop or something, yeah, or enhances something almost like a lighting designer, but is is carved out to highlight the door or something, but. But to do video for video's sake doesn't, it's not appealing. Well, you make a very, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, I had a terrible experience with video. I was working on a show called Cape Man. I went in, I came in to try to help it out. It was, it was in trouble. It did not have a book. Learn the first rule of doing a book musical is make sure you have oh. a book writer. <laughs> so had, and this one was absent. And, and in any event, we had a wonderful star by the name of Mark Anthony, a wonderful actor, singer, compelling, and in the middle of, I don't remember what, which act, there was documentary footage of the actual Kate man being booked and arrested and being interviewed, and it totally, it, it totally made, it, it made it impossible to come back to the actor uh -huh. and believe uh -huh. him as much as right. you did Just before you saw the projection, yeah. because the, the, the actor could not contend with the reality of what was projected massively. So that was that was a lesson. Don't let the projections upstage the actors. You, you made a big point, Beowulf, um, when you were talking about uh, New York, New York, that all of the backdrops for the were hand-painted. Um, and you won your second Tony for that. Um, do you think that there will be a revived interest in sort of analog methods of scenic design, and I'm thinking specifically, Mr. Zacks, of your production of The Music Man, which had that Wells Fargo wagon, it was Santa La Costa, right, which was one of the most exciting scenic effects I had seen, and it wasn't videoed, it wasn't projected, it was this kind of, it looked like it might have been a Bob Barker era Price is Right, just coming on down the way. Um, it, was, it was a little toy, yeah. a wonderful little toy, and it just, it made the audience use their imaginations. And having an audience exercise their imaginations is, is very powerful. It's, um, and that's what happened in, in that moment. I thought it was simple and inspired. And then, of course, the real one entered. And, you know, the one thing was a one two punch, you know, it was very, very effective. Yeah. It's really the key to all of it. It's, it's engaging the audience. It is. It, yeah. it, I quote Hal Prince in this, and he said it a lot that. So you can say when you want when you're doing a musical, you want to leave a lot of empty space, a lot of room for the audience to fill in the blanks, um, and that was that was his way of harnessing that. But you, he said, you want to make the audience complicit in the storytelling, and if you can do that, you engage people. Um, and whether that's more analog things or, or maybe I'm not opposed to video too. It's a very powerful tool. You just have to not let it run amok. And I, um, New York, New York was so consciously trying to be kind of a modern version of an old-fashioned musical, but it felt really important that we do the drops as painted drops, but 
in that case also I had imported this wonderful Ukrainian painter who I knew was brilliant, and I'd worked with her for years, but she'd retired and moved back to Europe, and I knew she had the ability to sort of give us something really magic. There's the beautifully painted drops, it's a dying art form, it's just, it's not really taught anymore, and there are very few people who can do it really brilliantly, and, and a badly painted drop is pretty awful <laughs> um, and, and just hokey, so it, but when it's done right, it can be really gorgeous with, you know, a great lighting designer, so like Ken Bellington, who knows how to take that and actually light it and make it beautiful, um, and, and a director who's telling the story in a way that's appropriate, you know, there are other shows where it would be ridiculous to do a painted drop, um, and, uh, but that was a show that it felt really important that it all be kind of tactile that way. Uh, I wonder if there's any, um, I wanted to open the floor to the audience, if there are any questions in the audience for, uh, yes ma'am. Yeah, I would love to know how much input do you like to get from the playwright? Well, uh, the input, well it's a collaboration with the playwright, so so it's more like saying to the playwright, that's not going to work. You have to <laughs> rewrite that and, and you just have to have a, a collaboration because the um, you know the playwright. It's very very important that the that the story goes forward, and and that whatever sometimes a playwright will insist on saying a line, but you don't have to say that line because you're seeing the line happen. So now we're we're doubling what needs to be. Mm -hmm. So it's getting the playwright on board with with what it takes to do this creature of a musical to. The collaboration of it, so um, so I wouldn't say it's the input of a, a playwright. It's it's just still the continuous collaboration with the playwright. But oh, but you know it's it's what we talked about before about collaboration. You're going to have input from every. You know, he always starts a sentence with, I know this above my pay grade, <laughs> but I don't like that costume. <laughs> and then and I look at the costume and then I discuss it, you know, but, but so everybody really, you, you take in, hear what everybody has to say, you know, whether you act on it's another thing. I think it's critically important. If you're not doing a revival and your playwright is alive, I think it's very important to hunker down with the player yeah. in private mm -hmm. and, and take stock of what we just witnessed, what worked, what didn't work. This is what I think. What do you think? But again, not in a it doesn't work in a large group. It's just the playwright, myself, my associate, yeah. and uh, you know, and then we call in the designers as necessary. Yeah. We're going to make changes, but something is either working or not. Something is either helping the story move forward or not. You know, something is being said, this, the same thing is being said three different ways. Mm -hmm. You only need to say it once. Yeah. You know, someone is, it, it would be much better if someone didn't have a line there, but just simply looked at the other actor and forced the audience to imagine what that person mm -hmm. is thinking in the silence, which an audience loves, you know. So, anyway, that. I, I always get the impression that that is an easier discussion to have with musical theater writers than playwrights. So I guess I'm just thinking of like Kander and Ebb and how they are totally open to their musicals being reimagined every time they come back to Broadway, or Stephen Sondheim, of course, who now has all of these very different revivals. And then, you know, I think about David Mamet, who says, you know, my words were handed down on a stone tablet like that, and it can't change. Am I wrong in assuming that? Assuming, sorry, that again. it's easier to have that kind of discussion with musical theater writers than playwrights. I don't know. I don't know. I, writers are writers. You know, the task is really, you know, the task is different uh, with the musicals because you've got so many more elements to help tell the story. Mm -hmm. In a play, you've got the words and the set, and you've got fewer, uh, you've got fewer ways to tell the story. Um, so yeah. there's certainly somebody like Terrence McNally who writes these incredible plays, but he knew how to collaborate to, to write Ragtime or Kiss the Spider Woman, or, you know, so I think they just have to get it in their head that it's not them alone in, in, right. a, in a closet writing their play, you know, it's, it's now they're, they're writing it and, and it's got to be shared with designers and such. And also an audience has a more cinematic eye now and, and the story always has to go forward and that whether that's done well, as the set changes with choreography, but you always have to keep telling the story. We can no longer sing the song Bill, and there's no Bill in the show, 
and and do a big blackout and wait for uh, somebody to build a boat to come on stage. <laughs> you know, an audience just won't won't do that. I, everything has to be um, about the story and um, supporting the story and moving forward and moving the plot forward. So it, it is. I mean, theater has really changed in that way. An audience isn't going to sit and wait for something to happen. All you have to do, I agree with you, all you have to do is go back to some of the classic musicals and listen to the overtures. I was just listening to the overture, Dear World, for some reason. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? It, the overture is five minutes and 30 seconds. Madness. Madness. <laughs> Let's luxuriate the beauty of my music for five and a half minutes. But five and a half minutes is not what it used to be. You it's know, it's used to, be, yeah. it was. Like, you know, used to be able to sit down and say we're going to enjoy this overture, and it doesn't matter that the story isn't starting for five minutes because I'm, the sound of the music is taking me there. It's having a positive effect. I would die. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, it's like, no, just, anyway. I think that's, that's yeah, a very product well of changing audience behavior, yeah. though. People would kind of feel more comfortable moving in and out during the overture in ways that maybe they don't anymore. Who's going to move in and out? <laughs> I mean, not anyone in, anymore, yeah, you know. No. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe theater, I, I don't know, I wasn't around in the 20s, but it's more of a drinking experience. I, yeah, I think latecomers were probably seated during the overtures, yeah, the long maybe. overtures. Yeah. But no, that's just the first of a thousand ideas that are going to come at you at a certain pace mm -hmm. and rate. The overture is the first one to establish the tone, to establish the sound of the music. Now, what happens next? The rate of new ideas moving the story forward. You know, I, I find that fascinating. That audience w audiences appear to have longer attention spans than than they do now. I don't know. Anyone else? Yes. We talked about the collaboration between director and designer. Could you talk a little about the designer's relationship with each other? Now you have a lighting designer, sound designer, set designer, production designer, yeah. and how that all collaborates. I feel like in school, I was taught, we were taught that like you all get in a room and everybody says, you know, how should we put this play on? And we all pitch ideas and make a thing out of that. And in reality, I don't think that, I, I don't know whenever I've ever experienced that professionally. I feel like I sit down with the director and we talk about what the show is. And as we begin to have ideas, then we may begin to include the other designers. But a lot of the set comes along. It's really, it's a collaboration between me and the director. And then as we begin to figure it out and we realize there's a ceiling on the set or whatever that's going to affect the lighting, then I call the lighting designer and say, we're talking about doing this. Is that okay? Or... Um, you know, we did a Bronx Tale. We made the set all red. So I called the costume designer. I said, you can have every color on the rainbow except red. The set is all red. Um, and so it's, I think part of being a professional is knowing when I'm doing something with the set that's going to kind of radically affect one of the other designers and how they're able to do their job. And then I need to go to them and say, this is what we're doing. What do I need to do to allow you to do your job in that environment? Um, it, there's meteor shower just popped up on the screen behind you, but that was an all white set, and I kept painting it like gray. And Jerry kept saying, "No, just make it white, just make it white." And I said, "I can't make it white. The lighting designer will kill me." And he said, "You've got to make it white." And so finally, I just called Natasha Katz and I said, "This is what we're going to do. How do you feel?" And we talked about it a bit, and she said, "Look, if you give, you know, the light's going to come in at a certain angle. If you can give me some darker furniture near the bottom of the wall, so that that." the light that's hitting the actor hits the dark furniture and not the white wall, then I can work with all the rest of it. And, and it worked fine. I don't think we ever had any trouble with it. But it, you just, you have to, you have to respect the other people's job and understand their job enough to, to hopefully not get in their way or, or you know, say, I'm, I'm doing this that makes your job difficult, but I'm going to do this other thing that makes it possible uh, for us to exploit the difficult thing and make it interesting. And I promise I'll keep the actors far enough away from the light wall <laughs> so you can light them and not have them compete. <laughs> yeah. Tasha Katz, unflappable. Yeah. In my limited experience, she has what, like eight Tonys now? Yeah. She's great. You know, she's just great. When design, you end up seeing the same handful of names, I think, on a lot of shows. Um, how many shows would you say you pitch every year, or do you anymore? Me? Yeah. Um, pitch. <laughs> 
I, I honestly don't even know. I, you know, I used to say I do 30 shows a year, but that was when I did much smaller shows. I, when I was when I started out, I would, but that's when we teched them yes. in two days, yes. and, and they ran for a week. Um, I don't know. I, I do 10, 15 shows a year now as wow. a set designer. I mean, that, as, a, as a set designer, that's sort of what you need to do to make a living, honestly. Yeah. When something like real, like New York, New York, which I, you know, pushed everything out of it for four months, I was just in the theater doing one show. And so this is an odd year for me with, with a really, really big project that really didn't, I couldn't do anything else at the same time. Um, but uh, I think a lot of the reason you see the same names over and over again is it's, it's in a completely unmeasurable profession other than whether the show makes money or not. Um, you you see people who have done it and you know they're not going to fuck it up. They're not going to waste mm. the million dollars. Mm. Um, particularly with the scenery is so expensive. You know, any Broadway musical now, it's, it says a million dollars at least, probably a million and a half, maybe more. And producers who are going to take that gamble want to know that the money's not going to be wasted. Um, I was talking to Brian McDevitt maybe a year ago. And he said, you know, if the lighting designer fucks everything up, pardon my language, you can bring in the lighting designer in previews and they can probably pull you out of the hole. But if the set designer screws it all up, you're stuck. Like, you can paint it blue, but you can't, you can't change the basic machine of what it's doing. Um, and it's, it, once you get into that club, it's great. But getting into it is hard and, and seemingly insurmountable, I think, for people who haven't gotten that Broadway break and been kind of allowed into the club. Will you do some work with that, with the 152 Project, uh, which is, if you want to explain. Yeah, for those who don't know about it, it I, um, during the pandemic, I presume people are mostly aware of the, the We See You White American Theater movement that started. Um, and I, I will say when I first read that, um, what they wrote, I was offended by it as, as, as a straight white guy. And once I got over being offended, I started thinking about it. I thought, well, damn, they're right about a lot of this. I mean, not all of it, but a lot of it. And I think I had naively assumed that people of color were not trying to be in the theater as, as directors and writers for socioeconomic reasons, whatever. Like, you, it's such an unstable profession that I think, I think I imagined people who didn't come from a background that could maybe support them through the tough years of this profession were not even trying. And what I realized is that's not true. It's there are people who are trying, but who maybe don't have the socioeconomic background to allow them in. And, you know, we all have the natural thing. I, I, I got my, my two big breaks in this business came from Hal Prince and, uh, and James Lapine, two straight white guys who I think saw a little bit of themselves in me. And it, it makes it a very white male profession, as, as the Western world is. Anyway, all which is to say, once it sort of hit me that maybe there are a lot of young designers of color and young women who are trying to get in this profession and not being allowed in for whatever reason, that felt to me morally wrong. Like, it's just not okay. It, I, I don't think you are owed anything on Broadway if you can't deliver, but you're not allowed, you should not be given less of a chance because you're a woman or because you're black or because you're Latino. Um, and in that year with nothing to do during the pandemic, at some point I had the idea that I, I at that point, come from the way I was running on Broadway and just going to reopen. And I thought, well, I get a royalty check every week on that. And if I went to every Broadway designer and said, we give one week of your royalties into a fund and let's use it to support young designers. Um, because anybody starting out in this career is hard. Um, it, there's just, there's just tough years. It, this is a bunch of theater people. Everybody knows that. Um, but, I thought, is, there, is that a way to, to give a group of young designers a hand up? And I put together this fund that we go out and I, I just harass every designer of mine. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, some of them give money and some of them don't give money. Um, but some of them have given very generously. And, you know, luckily there are some shows like Hamilton and Lion King that are making a lot of money. And some of those people have given very generously. And so in two years now, we've given out nearly $200,000 in grants to, to young designers. Um, um, uh, and, and you're all, it, I, it is focused on designers. The idea is give one week of royalties out of the year. Anyone can give money to it. If anyone is truly inspired by that, the website's online, oneevery52.org. 
Um, and it's, you know, the world is crazy right now. The theater is in rocky shape. And even in the two years I'm doing it, I'm watching it be harder to, to raise money. And yet, one of our recipients for the first, from the first year just had her Broadway debut this season. Oh. Um, and so it's, they're, they're, these kids are talented and really good. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, I'm, I am happy to see a story that's not just about another straight white boy. I don't want to see a boring story about somebody else, but there's a lot of stories out there, and the more we can get different points of view telling the stories, the more interesting they'll be, and the better our theater will be. There's my soapbox. <laughs> I think we are nearly at time, but are there any more questions before we... Oh, okay, yes, you, sir, and then back here. Good. Are there Broadway theaters that you would prefer to stake something in, and then ones that you would absolutely not want to Sure. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, sure, all the ones on 45th Street yeah. that are fantastic, yeah. that, you know, the, what used to be the Royale and the Golden and the Book, these wonderful play boxes, the music box is, is yeah, wonderful. wonderful. Some of them are vast, like the Winter Garden, but still built so smartly that it does, the, it can feel like a smaller house if you control the focus. And then there's the married marquee, and that's you know that's hard. That's hard. Just because it's just so impersonal and uh, you know. But I, I've I've never been able to blame a show not working on the theater. You know, I, <laughs> I'd like to. You know, but ultimately. Yeah, I think. Well, you know, I love the St. James, and I love the Schubert, and. No, beautiful, but um, but yeah, the because I think because we're storytellers too. The more the way the house is organized, so it's you can focus down on the actors to tell that story or the comedy. You're going to be better off. So when when there are giant vast theaters, it's it's less appealing. Yeah. Back here, yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, at this point in your career, you're only doing Broadway work, but everybody has to start somewhere. Is there anything you can miss about your career or working in this industry prior to your Broadway? Well, we, no, we go off Broadway. I did Summerstock yeah. in England with Susan Stroman a year ago. We were in the middle of nowhere with a walled Roman walls and, yeah, in <laughs> London <laughs> with no air conditioning. Yeah, no, no, oh, we, we go back. That's terrible. That's yeah. terrible, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, and, and I work at the Vineyard all the time and the Vineyard Theater and, we, no, we work, we we don't just work on Broadway. We work, work all over, you know, and and concerts and benefits and yeah, yeah. I'm a proud member of the Ensemble Studio Theater that's been there for the yes. last 15, oh, wow. 16 years and it's still going strong. And you know, uh, yeah, yeah. It has an excellent show right now. We understand Redwood. Oh, I've heard it's quite good. Have not I've seen not yet. Yet. Cool, but, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's often the best way to get and to put a show up for the first time and just figure out does it work when you don't have the, the bright lights and all the pressure and, and all the expense weighing you down as you're just trying to figure out, like, how do we tell the story? Yeah. yeah I can't. I, I certainly could not have made the transition from acting to directing without an off off Broadway theater to help me do it. You know, it just would not have happened. And, uh, I'm particularly fond of off Broadway and off off Broadway work. Yeah. Is there one more? And yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some discussion about how audiences change from the expected audience. I'm wondering what the how do you walk that line between your vision of a show that you know the show wants to be and you expect an audience that wants without losing track of what the show is? Well, yeah, I think it, it is difficult because. In the end, you, 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 you want to tell your story. You want to tell the story, and and some audiences um, might might not like it, but it's what you wanted to do. It's your piece of art. So it, it's it is hard because I know even with New York, New York, New York means something different to a lot of people. There's the Woody Allen New York. There's the Scorsese New York. There's the Nora Ephron New York. <laughs> You know, and people imagine themselves in like that kind of, I'm um, in one of those kind of New Yorks, you know. So <clears throat> we wanted to do New York, New York, and have it have a hopeful ending because of everything we've come out of. 
But I think people would rather have us done The Godfather or something. You have to tell the story you believe in. You believe and, and you it, hope yeah. the audience will like it. There's yeah. no point in trying to tell a story you don't believe in because yeah. it's not going to be good art then. Yeah. You have to go in really believing what you want to do and just hope the audience comes along with you yeah. and hope they come along. Well, thank you all for coming along tonight. <laughs> 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 <laughs>